world. All right. So the parasites, um, parasites are kind of similar to predators in that they're feeding on a live um, animal, but they tend to not kill their host, but often they're feeding on fluids. There are both ecto and endoparasites in the aquatic insect world. Um, endoparasites live inside the host and feed on fluids. And some examples would be aquatic hymenopterans, which are wasps and bees basically. So this little tiny wasp larvae that you see in the bottom, um, it preys on eggs and eats egg fluids. Um, but there are some endoparasitic trichopterans, coleopterans and, and dipterans as well. Ectoparasites are a little bit more challenging um, to identify, partly because an organism could be parasitic, but there could also be a mutualistic relationship, or maybe it's just commensal or amensal, or it could even be a phoretic relationship, meaning that they're just using someone else to hitch a ride, kind of to get transported around. So there are plenty of ectoparasites, and I talked about um, parasitic oligochaetes on crayfish, and we talked about parasitic leeches on fish. So there's certainly, um, maybe I guess those are both non-insects. So maybe ectoparasitic insects, maybe that, that's what's more challenging. Um, that's what the textbook said. So um, they, the kind of hitching a ride example, chironomids will use um, silk tubes to attach to hosts and get a ride. Uh, castor beetles will cling to beaver fur and catch a ride that way. Moving on to shredders, um, they're chewing. Some of them are xylophages, they eat wood. These are organisms that feed on coarse particulate organic matter and the microbes that colonize it. So they tend to have shredding mouth parts, um, shorter, stouter, kind of for cutting things. Their mouth parts are also suitable for scavenging and grinding. Um, some of them have scoop-shaped um, lacinia uh, of the maxilla with combs, teeth, and hairs that all kind of help guide food toward the mouth. And then the xylophages, which are some, some types of chironomids, tipulidae, trichopterans, coleopterans, and plicopterans, have really strong, very heavy, heavy sclerotized mandibles that allow them to chew through wood. So some of the organisms that you see at the bottom, um, Lara avadra, um, a, a caddisfly, and two caddisflies, one making its cases out of little bits of grass that it kind of cuts lengthwise like a log cabin, and the other making a case out of leaf materials kind of patched together like a quilt. So these are all organisms that are shredding up that organic material and sometimes using it to build their own cases. There are a few organisms that shred living plant tissues. Some of them are lepidopterans, so caterpillars and beetle larvae. They can be obligate herbivores. Um, so think like a caterpillar that chews up plants on land. They also do that underwater. So um, let's see here. There's this larval, um, oops, there's a misspelling in larval, Donacinae, um, which is a beetle larva that uh, chews on roots and rhizomes. And you can see the, the effect on the lily pad. This is called the water lily beetle. Um, it makes those kind of, the adult makes those spots on the lily pad and then the, adult, the larva goes down and chews on the roots and rhizomes and can um, harm the water lily. Okay, so moving on to algal piercers and bursters. Some insects can pierce individual algal cells and eat the cytoplasm from inside. So they might also have chelated forelegs that allow them to grasp filamentous algae and kind of pop cells open. Sometimes they have asymmetrical mandibles where one might be pointed and the other one has like a serrated edge so they can kind of um, grasp, puncture, and then swipe the material into their mouths. Some might also feed on mosses and bryophytes. Um, this is a Haliplidae um, beetle larva and an adult. Um, some of the most different looking larvae and adults that I, that I know of, um, really cute. And then moving on to grazers. Grazers tend to scrape attached biofilm, so paraphyton. Um, they tend to have brushes, rakes, and combs. Sometimes they have brooms or excavators. Um, they can often feed selectively, which can influence the succession of the biofilm and alter community structure. And 
because they're they're scraping the rock surface, there's a lot of wear and tear on mouth parts. But each time they molt at each instar stage, they molt and then they come out with bright, shiny, sharp mouth parts again. So that's kind of fixed every time they molt. Um, some of these kind of grazing mayflies go through many, many mold stages. So the the steps are really scrape. Scrape, collect, transport, and then crush. So, and all well, the water's moving past them. So not only are they trying to do these things, you know, then the water's whisking their hard earned um, algal cells away. So they often have these really large kind of head shields like you can see on this heptogeneid mayfly at the top. Sometimes they have upper, really hairy upper lips like they have a big mustache, right? So that keeps the water from getting into their mouth and knocking their algal cells out of it. And some of the brooms have these really interesting structures. These are scanning electron microscope images of, of like a, a broom that they might use to scrape and then the, um, the scraping apparatus on the surface of the broom and these kind of really cool seashell shapes. Here's a picture showing an advancing herd of grazers. So you can see they're really doing some serious damage to this algal paraphyton growth on the rock. These are all Blepharicidae um, larvae. So they're a true fly larva. Um, and, you know, they're just advancing along like you'd kind of see a herd of um, ungulates on the savanna or something. So grazers um, have these scraping brushes that are often supported by brooms with long sweeping bristles that can catch detached algal cells. When they take up the paraphyton, um, it's often made up of diatoms, which again have these cases of glass that they've built, these silica cases. And so the glass cases need to be cracked open and then um, Sometimes that can happen in what's called the proventriculus. So if you look at the top, there's kind of a picture showing an insect's mouth and its salivary glands and a crop. The proventriculus is this kind of like muscular place where some crushing can happen. So not all insects have this proventriculus, but um, it, it is a helpful, um, has a helpful function. And then, um, some other organisms might use kind of molar, like almost like grinding molars on the surface of their mandibles that can kind of strain out algal cells and then um, kind of chew them up. And then the other thing that's nice is that there's fine bits of sand kind of mixed into this paraphyton with the algae and the fungi and the bacteria and all the stuff that's growing in this really complicated biofilm. There's little bits of sand and clay. And so that can actually help um, the organism grind up the material. So kind of like the stones in a bird's gizzard, all these little bits of sand kind of help them to masticate and break open the cells. Okay, moving on to the collectors. You can either be a collector gatherer, which is an organism that just kind of wanders around and eats things. Um, they're also called deposit feeders. They typically are feeding on fine particular organic matter, F palm. And they often have, you know, little brushing mouth parts to help sweep things up. So um, a small organism like this chironomid midge might just wander around, wiggle around and pick up little things and try to eat them. Um, the food is often mixed with water, so they have mandibles help filter out the, the food part, filter the water, you know, get the water out. Um, some chironomids can spread some sticky saliva on their little pro leg and stick it out into the water column and then stuff gets stuck to it and then they can bring it back in and, and lick it off, wipe it off. They don't have tongues, but wipe it off. So it's almost like they're filter feeding, but they're really kind of grabbing it out of the um, water column. So this, this is a little different. These are typical collector filterers. You can see all of these caddisflies with their arms kind of waving out in the air. Um, they're feeding mainly on F palm, um, but it's suspended particles in the water column. And so most collector filterers have a sedentary or a passive feeding strategy in flowing waters. So they just get to sit there stuck to the surface and let stuff float past them and catch it or if they're in still water, they'll have a mobile strategy. Well, they'll swim around and try to get things caught in their um, hairy appendages. So collector filters are again feeding on a mixture of algae, detritus, fungal spores, feces, myofauna, which is tiny little, like the gastrotrix and the rotifers and the paramecium, things like that, bacteria. And as a filter feeder, you can either filter with your body parts or you can filter by building something. 
So if you filter with your body parts, you might have some kind of like brushes or long hairs that things can get trapped on. So here you can see this mosquito larvae has large mouth brushes that it can kind of, as it's swimming around, things will get trapped and it can eat them. Um, there's a really furry kind of mustache on this Murfiella, um, which is a, a, a mayfly larva. And so it has these filtering fringes, or you can have filters on your forelegs as shown in on the left for Oligoneriella. Um, as it moves around, it's filtering from its forelegs, kind of like those um, trichopterans in the previous picture. Um, Simuliidae are a fly larva in this family, and they have these really cool cephalic fans that they put out into the water column and filter, and then they can pull them into their mouth and clean them off. Um, you can see often you see a lot of simulias in colonies on rocks in really swift moving water, and so um, they're getting getting a lot of filtering done, so they're cleaning up the water column, um, but they usually need swift moving water. And then you can filter with tubes and nets. So here's some pictures of different um, two caddis flies on the left. So the kind of the big, the big weird um, kind of almost cornucopia shaped filter. Um, another one that makes a little fine mesh filter um, and a little retreat. And then actually a chironomid looks like he's up for a boxing match in a, in a, a boxing ring, but it's really um, a tube that it's built and um, can filter thing, particulate matter out of the water. Here's another picture of um, the caddisfly, one type of caddisfly net. So this is a hydrocycidae. Um, and you can see how it's built this silk net between some rocks and then it, it's hiding inside and waiting for things to get captured. It will come out and kind of clean the net off really frequently. And you can see it has modified um, arms with brushes to help clean it off without destroying the net. Um, the other thing that's really crazy about these caddis flies is there have been studies showing that they actually help hold the substrate together um, and keep, you know, keep the bed, the, um, the bed load or kind of the, the substrate from moving during floods when you have lots of these caddis flies building their nets. And then to end, here's just a picture um, similar to the picture of all of the caddis flies with their arms sticking out of the water. These are these are caddis fly larvae flies that um, some fly fishermen decided to make. Uh, it's just it was an interesting display because it looked so much like the the other picture I showed you. So caddis fly larvae and um, sorry fly fishermen are obsessed with making um, lures that look just like aquatic insects. All of the aquatic insects you're le you're learning about. So if you have a fly fisherman in your family or in your circle of friends, you'll have endless hours of things to talk about. Now that you're taking aquatic entomology. All right, see you next time.